Well, good morning. Good morning. A joy to be with you guys. I, um, I want you to actually shout this out. This isn't a rhetorical question. When you think about the, the most well-known things that Jesus ever said, what are some of the things that come to mind? John 3.16? Beatitudes? Cheaters. I heard something over here. This is my body. Lord's Prayer. Yep. Anything else? Yep, the children, and then let the children come to me too, right? That's a big one. There's a whole bunch. For God so loved the world, we had that one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, right? That's one that, like, even today in the culture that doesn't do Jesus a whole lot anymore, even that one people know, right? Like, most people in your neighborhood have said, like, do you know the whole, like, you shall love your neighbor as yourself? Yeah, that sounds familiar. Well, Jesus said that. No, right? There's all these things when we think about words of, of the Lord as he spoke, the red letter stuff in Scripture, uh, it becomes apparent that Jesus' words are really well-known. However, one of the most well-known sections of, of Jesus' words, the things that he himself, while on this earth, said, the stuff that's red letter in your Bibles, is the Beatitudes. Right? The Beatitudes are just this, this kind of section of, of teaching that is universally known. Even today, there are people outside of a church context that have heard the Beatitudes. Maybe if you grew up in the church, actually raise your hand if this is you. Who memorized Beatitudes in a, in a like VBS or Sunday school class when they were little? Raise your hand. There's, there's a couple of you there. I, that's, I was, that was drilled into me you know, very, very early on. You know, blessed be the, blessed be the, blessed be the. And you got stickers for memorizing it. Uh, there's whole VBS themes about the Beatitudes of, of Jesus. It's one of those things that in church life, you're not going to be able to spend a whole lot of time in church before you encounter the Beatitudes of Jesus. However, how much do we really know about the Beatitudes? What do we know about what their main purpose is? Right? What do we know about what Jesus is trying to really communicate at the heart of all of them? How do they relate together? Are they just a, a gathering of sayings, of, of kind of fortune cookie wisdom? Of, yeah, if you do these things, it will go well for you, right? Are they kind of proverbs? Are they things that we could put on a cookie at a Chinese restaurant? If you're meek, you know, blessed are you. Or is there more to them? Are they cohesive? How do they fit together? Why are we talking about meekness and then we're talking about mourning? And why are those who mourn blessed? I don't like to mourn. How is that a blessing to me to be in mourning? And, and how do these things kind of all fit together? And, and why would Jesus choose to talk about them when he talks about them? And how do they fit in the, the larger narrative? Today, we're going to spend some time starting to dig into that. For the next three weeks, we're going to look at the Beatitudes of Jesus. And they split beautifully. So this week, we're, going to, we're not actually going to get into any individual Beatitude, so to say. right? But we're going to spend some time looking at the foundations of where this passage sits and how it comes to life and why Jesus said it, when he said it, how he said it, why he said it, all those things. And then next week, we're going to look at the first four of the eight Beatitudes. And they all deal with how we relate to God vertically. And then two weeks from now, we're going to look at the last four of the eight Beatitudes, which relate to how we function with each other horizontally, man to man. So intro, man to God, man to man. Pretty simple format, excellent thing to launch into for the summer. All right. We're going to get away from heavy things a little bit. The Beatitudes um, are, are really, oh, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, uh, are, are, are a really unique kind of opening to a larger context sermon, and we'll dig into that when we get started. But for, for now, I want us to stand and just read through it uh, together. Uh, well, not together, but you listen, if that makes sense. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of do this, we'll have the same scripture passage every single week for the next three weeks. So next week when you come, you're going to stand and read the exact same thing again. Here's the Beatitudes in the book of Matthew, chapter 5. Uh, we see glimpses of them in the Gospels outside of Matthew, but Matthew is the one Gospel that contains the fullness of, of the Beatitudes together. And so read along with me. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. 
Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's the word of the Lord. Have a seat. There's, there's two primary themes that kind of permeate not just the Beatitudes, but all that surrounds them that help us kind of get a grasp on what to do with these before we ever dig into any individual one. And those two, it's, it's double A, you can remember double A, the two big themes are approval and authority. Right? And we'll get to both of these in our time this morning, but first I want to try to place the Beatitudes kind of in their proper context. The Beatitudes serve as the introduction to what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. Right? It's the largest or longest recorded sermon of Jesus. I think we, you know, if you read it straight through, it's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The whole chapter is start to finish are, are the Sermon on the Mount. And if you read it through, you'd probably take maybe 10, 15 minutes, depending on how fast of a reader you are. But it's kind of a, a snippet, right? It's not a verbatim script of every single thing that was, that was taught on, on the Sermon on the Mount. We estimate that that sermon probably took hours to complete. And so you picture the scene that Jesus has, has gathered these crowds. You know, he's, it's, it says he went up on the mountain and the disciples gathered around him. And he's kind of in this mode where he's teaching. And one of the things that's, that's unique that, that, that I learned that has nothing to do with how this applies to you, but I think we ought to try someday, is back then, one of the ways you knew that a rabbi was about to teach is they would actually sit down with the crowd. So in the Sermon on the Mount, while Jesus was preaching for hours on end, Jesus was actually reclined and sitting down, and all the people stood around him. Right? Now I stand and you sit. So think of it as backwards. Now imagine if I got to sit in like a nice little you know, beanbag chair or something right here, and you guys all had to stand through my whole sermon. Who would make it all the way to the end? <laughs> Every once in a while I go long on a sermon and it frustrates you. I can only imagine the emails I would get if you had to stand through the whole thing. But they did that so that you wouldn't fall asleep. It kind of kept you going all right, through the teaching. Uh, and the rabbi would sit and they would go on and on and on. So Jesus has gathered his crowds. And one of the things that's noteworthy is, as Jesus walked and taught and had people following him, it constantly talks about wherever he went, the, the crowds would gather around him. What we have to understand here is this sermon on the mount is not meant for the multitudes in the crowds. Right? It tells us before the start of this that, that the Lord went up to the mountain and his disciples followed and gathered around him. And so we go from Jesus being in the town with all of the people, those who follow him and those who didn't, who just came because they were curious and, you know, the hundreds and thousands of people listening and, you know, all, all those being so many that they had to be fed and feeding miracles and all the, all the kind of scene that we usually think of. This is just Jesus and his disciples, right? Not the, just the 12, but all those who kind of are following him, who are actually on board with what he's saying and walking and going everywhere he goes, right? So there's a whole lot of people, but the thing to understand is this is a sermon aimed at the church folks. This isn't an evangelistic sermon for those who don't know who Jesus is out there. Right? And so when you read any of the Sermon of the Mount, but especially also the Beatitudes, it is not meant for the non-Christian. It's meant for those who know him, who are his disciples, who are following him, who are under them. He says, look, you guys, I've been teaching the crowds. Let's gather in. I have something to say to you guys. This is for you. Right? It's for his followers. As Jesus begins the sermon, which is, lasts us three chapters, he starts with this pronouncement of eight beatitudes. The word beatitude is just a fancy word for blessings, which can help us until we start to ask something like, well, what does it mean to be blessed? How do we define the word blessing? When I say bless you because you sneeze, what am I actually saying to you? Is, is that kind of the, the weird, worldly way of using that word? Kind of like when I say I love ice cream the same way I say I love my wife. They're obviously not the same, right? I love one more than the other. Chocolate ice cream, clearly. 
right? <laughs> My wife's home, so she's glaring, but you can't see, right? The word blessed has some very specific meanings, and we need to understand it to be able to understand what our text today is about, right? We use this word a lot, and we use it a lot of time out of its proper context. To be blessed, we sometimes think of as to be content, maybe to have happiness, to have joy in our life, to be in a state of goodness. Like, everything's good, right? When you had a really great day, like, you just say, man, I just feel blessed today. Right? I, a couple months ago, I had the perfect day. Like, we had a, we had a, a, somebody broke our car and we had to have it fixed and they gave me like this souped up minivan and they gave me the van the day that I had to get a grill for the church and I went and got a steal of a deal on a grill for the church, like half price of what it normally was and I wouldn't have been able to take it but I had the van so it fit in the van that I normally wouldn't have had and then I'm driving to the church and I won something in a giveaway that I got a call that I had won and then our kids behaved. It was one of those like perfect days and at the end of the day I'm like, number one, I should have played the lottery and, and number two, I was just, man, it's, it's one of those days I just feel blessed. Like everything just kind of fell into place. But that's not what blessed actually means. It's not about our, our state of happiness, of joy, of contentment, of things going the way we want them to go, of having a day where you know, stuff doesn't go awry or wrong. Blessed is a very specific mean, meaning. And in this way of thinking, uh, it, it means how God sees you and how God thinks of you. That's what the, what, that's what the word blessed means. It is, it is kind of the status of approval of how God views you. Right? So when, you, when God says you are blessed, what he's saying is you are walking in a way that is approved by, by what God would have you walk as. Right? And that brings happiness. It's a good thing to walk in the ways of the Lord. It's a good thing that in whatever we're doing and caring about our day, the Lord would say yes and amen. I am with and behind all the choices that you're making. That thing you're doing, that way you're thinking, that those words you're saying, those actions you're taking, those decisions you're making, I am, I am behind that. That is exactly how I want you to be functioning in your day-to-day -day life. That, I am, that, that is what it means to be blessed. To walk in the favor and the approval of the Lord. And if we think of it the wrong way, we miss any chance of understanding what the point of the Beatitudes actually is. The world looks at the Beatitudes as fortune cookie wisdom. And a lot of people know the Beatitudes, but they don't know them in the proper way. One of the most famous people that has openly proclaimed and shared a love of the Beatitudes and uses them to inform his teaching is actually Gandhi. Gandhi loves the Beatitudes. You can find all kinds of quotes about Gandhi referencing and talking about the Beatitudes of Jesus. But they're a moralistic teaching. It's like a do this and you'll be good. Things will go well for you. Right? It's, it's not what God intends. And most of the world's teaching is influenced by a poor understanding of what the Beatitudes actually are. Right? Blessing is about God's approval. Blessing communicates something about the way God views you. To be blessed means to be living in a manner that is approved and amenable to God. Right? Max Lucado actually says that, you know, has this quote, that blessedness is the, it indicates the applause of heaven. You're going about your day. You're doing things the way God calls you to. And heaven's applauding your choices. That's blessedness. It's to sit under the favor, the approval of God. Now, at this point, we need to pause. As one of the larger themes of the whole Sermon on the Mount, and really the whole Gospel of Matthew, is this idea of law versus heart. Right? When Jesus gets up to preach, one of the primary points of the entire Sermon of the Mount is Jesus is trying to get his people to understand what it means to follow God because of a heart relationship, not because of a law that demands it. Right? And that's something that's really hard for us. The sermon is about how we live blessed by God, but not by following the law. It's out of a relationship with the Savior and a loving response that we want to start to do things a certain way. And that's for us as Christians and as people under sin, really hard to put our minds around. The best illustration I've ever heard is this. I hate speed limits. When I drive on a highway, my, my mind actually calculates. It says 70. How far over do I think I can go 
past a police officer to where he'll, he'll say, that's ah, not worth it. And in my mind, when I drive on the highway, I do 78. That's what I decided. I have no logic as to why. I'm probably wrong. Right? If I ever got pulled over, what would I say? Well, I was only doing eight miles. Over. For me, I don't know. Because if I do 79, it could register as 80, and the 80 is too much, and any cops worth their salt will pull me. Right? Like I, but I do the dance in my mind, the legalistic dance. How far can I go over the line and still kind of be within the, within, you know, the OK parameters? Right? And I'll follow a speed limit only once when I'm driving and my app says speed check ahead. <laughs> it's, a, it's the greatest invention ever. If you don't, there's an app called Waze. If you don't know it, download it. It will literally, like, people can, if they see a speed check, they'll punch it in, and then it'll tell you that there's a speed check there. It warns you of all the hazards. So you can go, like, 80 down the highway, and it'll say, hey, a mile from now, there's a cop. You're like, thank you, community of awesome people. And you slow down, and then you go by, right? It's like the radar detector on steroids. But here's the thing. I'm a renegade on the highways, and then came the day that I had to bring Graham, our son, home from the hospital in his car seat. And the speed limit on the highway was 65. And I had a whole row of people behind me angry because I was going 30 miles an hour. <laughs> Why? Not because I was following any rules, right? I wasn't behaving and driving under the speed limit out of any kind of legal compulsion. I was doing it out of a love for my son who was in the back and about this big. And I was terrified of what might happen if I get into an accident. So I'm driving. <laughs> People are like, how are you going slow? And, and Britta's emotional, so she's not even paying attention to what speed I'm going. And poor people behind me just had no idea. I should have had like a sign on the back that says new dad or something. But man, you better believe I was going the speed limit. You better believe when those, when those babies were in the car, holy cow, I would be the most frustrating guy on the road. I became the guy I hated in my road rage itself. Not because the law told me to, but because the love of my children compelled me to do a certain thing a certain way. I'm going to operate in a manner that is safe and good. That's what it means to follow the way that God calls us to live. Not out of a legal compulsion or obligation. Not because of some self-righteousness or so that we can earn God's favor. But because we love the Lord. And we're in relationship with Jesus. And there's a better way and we accept it because we know it to be true. And we just do it out of, out of, out of the fact that that's what's right. Out of a response to the love that God gave to us. Right? And so when we talk about the Beatitudes and the things that God says, these are the things that will cause me to have approval for you, it's not a legalistic thing. If you're looking at the Beatitudes of like, man, I don't measure up to this. I need to try harder and work better so that God will love me. No, right? you're missing the point. Say, like God already loves you. God already died for you. God already saved you. God already cares about you. And you go, man, that's so great. In light of this new reality, right, this, this completely different me, this is where I'm going to move, and this is how I'm going to act, and this is what I'm going to think, and this is how I'm going to speak, right? And so it's not a compulsion thing. It's a love and relationship thing. We have to understand that. So then we come to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Our hearts change. We move from begrudging obedience to a loving obedience of the heart. That's a whole different way of looking at it. Ultimately, that approval that we get, that blessedness, ends up bringing us joy and happiness rather than the things that we thought we could seek it in ourselves. The second major theme that we see in the Beatitudes is not just approval, but authority. We see this authority throughout the whole text and the context that surrounds it, right? If you look at the Beatitudes, the first and the last one, the promises are both the same, Right? We're promised this, this, the kingdom, essentially. Right? They will be part of the kingdom of God. And so there's this royal kind of theme, this implication that Jesus is a king. So the Beatitudes themselves have this aura at the start and at the finish of, of Jesus' authority. Right? If we put the, the whole thing in the larger context of the Sermon of the Mount, right? Jesus, you know, the sermon starts with Jesus sitting down as the rabbi, the teacher, the one who has authority. He sits and everybody stands and the crowds listen to him because he's somebody who has weight. And then we get to the very end of the Sermon on the Mount in 7 verse 28 and it says, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. 
So we see this theme of authority in the beginning and end of the Beatitudes. We see it in the beginning and end of the Sermon on the Mount that the Beatitudes are inside of. And then we can go to the whole Gospel of Matthew itself and we see this authority kind of exuded. Matthew's Gospel opens with a genealogy and it's a demonstration of how Jesus is the descendant of David, the promised Messiah, the King. Right? So it establishes his kingly authority among the Jews in the way that they thought he would come. And then at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, when we have, what, the great co- Yeah, the great commission, go in all the world. How does it start? Before he gives us that commission, he says what? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So even the Gospel of Matthew, it starts with this kingly Jewish authority. And then by the time the Gospel's over, it's authority over all things, the whole universe. Right? The whole Gospel of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, ooze this authority language of Jesus. It's the undertone of the entire thing. And so as Jesus opens his Sermon on the Mount, right, and we started by asking, what are some of the most famous sayings of Jesus? Right? We have to understand the words of Jesus, all of them, but especially these, are incredibly authoritative. They're more important, more authoritative, more significant than any other words on earth. Think about how crazy it is in the world history that the words of Jesus have survived all the way to this time. I know they're not the most relevant words of culture today, but through all the rising and falling of empires and, and dominating authority figures and nations have come and gone and the world political sphere has shifted all over the place. This, this word, the word of God, has somehow made it through all of that. No one's talking about the, the code of conduct texts of the Babylonians or the Assyrians, the, the gods who they held dear and the things that they said. Can you quote me anything from the God of Baal? No, you can't. Even people that we think of as significant on this earth. Who here can quote me more than two sentences from any of the major world speeches? Anybody here? Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream. Anything more than like two or three sentences? Right? Right? Lincoln, four score. Keep going. I'm waiting until like the third or fourth sentence. That's when usually people kind of start to fizzle out, right? Like those things kind of stick, but they don't. But when I ask you, what are the words of Jesus? You just keep going and going and going. Jesus somehow has made it through, right? There's this whole thing of like, well, the Western world and the colonization of, of things, and that's why it maintained. You don't understand, like most of the places where colonization happened, the gospel had already been there, right? People are like, well, the word of God was authoritative in Africa because, you know, Europe brought it down there. No, it didn't. The word of God was in Ethiopia before it was anywhere in Europe. It's this authoritative word that carries weight, that is more important and more significant and has been preserved more in the minds and the hearts of people throughout human history than anything else. Right? Jesus' words have remained. They are authoritative. And so what does this have to do with the Beatitudes? The blessings are pronouncements of life under the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus, in, in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, at the beginning and end of the Beatitudes, is establishing his authority because the pronouncements, the Beatitudes themselves, are a pronouncement of that authority that he has over our lives. Right? It's describing, it's a description of how things will be under the kingdom of heaven. And so in one way, the Beatitudes are instructional to us. They're like, look, if you live this way, if you think these things, if you act like this, if you speak like this, if this is how you conduct yourself, you will be blessed. You will find yourselves under the approval of God. So there's an active kind of call to the Beatitudes. You should try to be this way. But they're also a pronouncement about the reality of the kingdom when it's fully ushered in. Here's why this is really important. Raise your hand if in the last year you have found yourself in mourning. Over the course of that last year, have you found yourself constantly feeling comfort? Constant? Are you always comforted? Or are there times where you're just desperate? Where you feel like comfort is nowhere to be found? Right? 
If you've acted meek in the last year, have you been trampled on anyway? Do you feel like every time you've been meek to people that don't deserve it, do you feel like you've inherited the kingdom of heaven? I don't. Right? I've, I've shown mercy and kindness to people who don't deserve it only to have them walk all over me or talk behind my back or, or wrong me or my family in different ways over the course of the years. I can tell you right now, if I read the Beatitudes as a, if I'm a Christian, this is what I get, man, half the time I find myself not getting what the Beatitudes are promising, even when I try to act the way that they call me to act. It's not a perfect formula in this world, is it? It's not eight statements of, if you do this, this will happen. If you do this, you will be blessed. If you do this, you'll get a lot. If you do this, you'll be healthy. If you, right? That's not how it works. The reality is this. Most of us are not experiencing constantly the fruits of the Beatitudes when we try to live the way that they call us to. Right? And the reason for that is because they are not necessarily a blueprint for how life in a sinful world actually functions, but rather they're a pronouncement of the gospel themselves. N.T. Wright says this really beautifully. He says, Jesus is not suggesting that these are simply timeless truths about the way the world is, about human behavior. If he was saying that, he was wrong. Mourners go uncomforted. The meek don't inherit the earth. Those who long for justice frequently take that longing to the grave. Right? This is an upside-down world, or perhaps a right-way-up world. And Jesus is saying that with his work, it's starting to come true. This is an announcement, not a philosophical analysis of the world. It's about something that's starting to happen, not about a general truth of life. It is gospel, good news, not good advice. It's important that we don't see the Beatitudes as fortune cookies or a blueprint for our life. What it is, is a gospel promise in many ways yet unfulfilled, but it's a coming promise of the kingdom of God. If you find yourself in mourning and you go, man, I don't know if this is ever going to end. It might not in this world, on this side of heaven. But the promise of of God, of of Jesus, with with all the authority and weight behind him that he ever could have, is that, listen, my kingdom, when it's fully realized, is a place where all mourning will be comforted. You will never find yourself in mourning without immediate, full, gratifying comfort that comes alongside of it that will obliterate any mourning that you might experience. In my kingdom, the meek always inherit the kingdom. Right? Those who do the right thing have the right thing happen to them. Justice is perfect in my kingdom. You think life's not fair? Have you gone through a world where there's justice you're seeking that you haven't found and you don't see how you're ever going to find it before you die? Guess what? That's how it is. But in my kingdom, justice will reign perfectly all the time, every time. Every single beatitude is something that on the other side of heaven, when God's kingdom is fully ushered in, is perfectly how things will be. If A, then B becomes true in the kingdom of God. And if you press into it, you will be blessed. In other words, if you press into that reality now, right, you will win the approval of God. Not the saving approval. You don't earn that. Right? God loves you and saved you because he loves you. But on your day-to-day walk with God, you will be met with approval and with blessing if you walk in the ways that the Beatitudes call you to. Right? And that will have the byproduct of bringing you an immense amount of joy. So as we dive into these Beatitudes over the next few weeks, as we look at the four vertical ones next week and the four horizontal ones the week after that, here's some questions to kind of ask yourself, too. Number one, do you want God's approval more than anyone else's? Genuinely ask yourself that question this week. And and don't ask yourself, what is a Christian should my answer be? We all, we all know that one. That's easy. But, but actually ask yourself, like when you walk through your day-to-day life, does it reflect, like do, do you actually seek the approval of God in your affairs more than the approval of others? If not, ask yourself why. And this isn't meant to be a, a guilt trip. I'm asking myself the same questions right alongside of you. But, but man, I'm sure most of us walk through our days as if we're looking for approval from really anything else other than God, don't we? We find ourselves just easily slipping away from that that truth and that reality. Do you care about how God views you and sees you 
and what he desires for your life more than anyone else. And if not, think about that. Pray about that. Number two, do you accept God as the ultimate authority of life? Do you trust that his authority is sovereign? As you go through the world and you see that there's parts of these beatitude promises that are not happening and not realized, do you trust that they will be? That he's in charge, that his kingdom is coming, that eventually your reward will be received in heaven. And are you ordering your life in such a way that lives into that truth, that actually lives the way you say that you think and believe? The answer to these questions is going to form the foundation of how much these Beatitudes can and will shape your growth and your walk in Christ. And so those are things to think about and to pray about as we move into next week and gather again to talk about the first four of them and how they shape us in our day to day. All right, let's pray. God, we love you. We're so thankful for your teaching. We're thankful for the whole word, the whole counsel of God, every single dot and tittle and period and comma and all the, all the ways in which you speak to us. But Lord, we're especially grateful when we get to hear the word of the Lord through Jesus Christ speak directly to us. When we get to hear the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples, to his followers in that time, in our time. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is in the business of ushering in your kingdom. That gradually as the world goes on and on and on, we might more and more start to realize the promises, the blessings that come with being a part of you and who you say you are. We thank you that you've called us to be yours. We thank you that you shape us. We thank you that you give us your spirit to help us to continue to press into your truth. And so Lord, we pray that you would equip us and mold us to be a people that usher in your kingdom. That seek to live the blessed results of the Beatitudes. Not because it somehow earns us righteousness, but because we love you, because you love us, because we just want to respond in gratitude. Shape us, mold us, be with us. Continue to remind us of your truth and of who you are. We love you and we praise you. And all his people said, Amen.